grant money. And uh, we just heard the other night that crazy cash will be going on again this year because for a while there it looked like the Boric Jennings Legacy Hall was going to become partitioned inside. And um, we would lose all that open space and the Kiwanis were in a bit of a panic as to where they're going to hold crazy cash because they need room for 500 people. And they were just told uh, last week that the modifications of the Legacy Hall are put off until April. So crazy cash is March 3. So we're good. And um, the Historical Society will be considering whether to apply for a grant of some sort from crazy cash. It's a great way to get some funding for these kinds of projects. So a lot of what you're seeing here tonight is a result of crazy cash from last year. Okay, um, let me begin by telling a bit about the background of this talk. Um, about a month before sesquicentennial started, um, I had an email from um, Kate Spruitt McGough, who's sitting up here in front. You and Rory want to stand for a minute? <laughs> Kate Spruitt McGough and her husband Rory, they bought a house out on Sharon Hollow Road, uh, north of Pleasant Lake, up to what I think is almost Grass Lake, like kind of way up there. And um, they just bought the house and they were curious about the history of their house. I mean, they're one of about 50 requests we've had just this year. And um, we were in the middle of sesquicentennial, so we had to hold off for a bit and uh, finally got back to it. And um, so I contacted Kate and she says, um, well, our house, we were told our house was built in 1917. It was the Paula Curtis home. So if any of you that know Paula Curtis, it was her home. Um, she had moved up to Chelsea to retirement community. The house was sold and they bought it. And um, so I started doing some quick research and um, they said the house was built in 1917. But if you look at the 1856 and 1864 Sharon Township plat maps, there's clearly a house there. The Henry Rowe, the Rowe family was very big in the early days of Sharon Township, uh, Rose Corner, all that stuff. And the Rowe family was all over the place in Sharon Township. And their property was owned by Henry Rowe and the little plat map shows a house exactly where their house is sitting. Same thing with 1864 plat, 1874 plat. The owners are changing, it went from um, the Rose to the Hines, and then in 1915, which is the closest plat map we have to the date they were interested in, um, it's Fred Brisley. So I said, this is kind of strange. They said, we have a four square house. So I went out and looked at their house and clearly it's a four square house. This is a 1910s, 1920s house. It's not an old, old house. Um, so the theory kind of stuck in my mind, were they hit by the tornado? because I knew the 1917 tornado came through that area. So I went and visited. So what I'm going to do is show a couple of pictures. If you could just talk about what you're doing with the house mm -hmm. and what may be still original from the 1800s on it. So let me get that slide up there. So anyways, this was just kind of illustrating the topic. It's not necessarily any particular tornado around here or anything like that. Uh, but uh, okay. So your house. So yeah, so we bought it about February of 2015, 2016. And um, so Rory wanted land, and I wanted um, I wanted an old house. Oh, and I wanted the old house because I've always loved old houses. So um, we. Um, we we're trying to renovate it a little bit and kind of keep with the historical period. Um, and we do, there was some original things that could have been prior to 1917. Um, the foundation of the house um, is possibly prior to 1917. And there's this, this chimney that goes up that's um, possibly a center um, chimney. It was a yeah, center, it's a center, a center chimney. Center of the house, yeah. Yeah, um, but it's not in the roof or anything like that. So it was just through the center and in the basement, and I don't even think it's in the upstairs. So that could have been prior to 1917. So, Rory, do you want to talk about a little bit about what you're doing to the? You want your notes? No. Okay. Um, we're slowly, very, very slowly fixing up the house. <laughs> we. Uh, um, we pulled up the uh, the carpets on the on the main uh, floor, and some of the carpets was you know this gorgeous finished wood floor just mm -hmm. waiting for us. Um, and some of the carpets it was 
quarter inch mastic waiting for us. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so that's been fun. Um, the, uh, the, the main floor, the, the wood flooring is a lot nicer. Um, it's a lot better quality than the upstairs. So the main floor might have been put in um, back in the 1800s and they just went in with a cheaper floor when the entire mm. house got knocked down. Possibly, I don't know. Um, and the, uh, they've, they, they took out a lot of things in like the 70s or whatever. They got rid of all the hardwood molding and came back yeah. in with just little <laughs> tiny. Uh, that little thin molding. Yeah, yeah, so, and they left it in some of the, uh, like the laundry room, they left it in there and just painted it, you know, because it was hid away and nobody would seen it. And they have to be ashamed of that crude construction. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, out right behind the house, our, our well is still located. It's, it's an old masonry well. It's been demoed to ground level and filled in with sand now, but it's still in the same location. I had to put in a new water line in it when I dug it out. Um, it was masonry walls of the old well there, so that was kind of cool. The, uh, this is our old barn, and uh, um, it's the back level, which has kind of got the elevator out. I took this picture today, and I'm got a lot of things going on so it's kind of messy sorry um, <laughs> but the uh, the main floor there you drive in and that was like the hay um, the hay storage and then underneath would have been for animals um, the uh, the barn probably talking to Ray probably survived the tornado it's listed by the tack register as being there since 1904 um, it's got some different types of siding on it. Some of it's a newer tongue and groove pine siding and a lot of it's an older um, just rough saw and oak siding. So, so it might have lost some of the siding in the, um, in the tornado and other pieces but the uh, just the fact that the tax register has it as 1904 we kind of think that it probably survived um, more so than the house. But um, I think uh, uh, the the barn's kind of cool because the uh, the design of it would have been for like to back um, back a horse drawn wagon in and uh, stack it all with loose hay and uh, the original rail and uh, and hook for the for the barn is still hanging up there it hasn't been touched in I don't know hundred years but it's still just hanging up there so but anyway so the barn needs obviously some uh, some TLC we will end up residing it before too long but a lot of fun it'll go slow we got a couple yeah. kids and a lot yeah. of things going on so <laughs> two and four so. <laughs> well thank you so much for coming tonight for sharing the pictures um, as I mentioned when when I first went out there um, I said clearly the maps show that there's an older house there at least 60 years before the 1970 date, 1917 date, they were told for their house. And I went out there and looked at it and said, that's clearly a, a four square house. It's, it's more, more of a modern design. Um, but having that center chimney running up through the house and just cutting off and ending abruptly, that clearly must have been left over from the old days. I pictured a tornado blowing everything down. Here's a chimney still standing there. And they just boxed it in and put in a different heating system. So um, it kind of got me going on this, you know, we started to look at where this tornado had touched down and one of the names that popped up right away was Curtis. Now they bought it from Paula Curtis who was a wife of a Curtis who passed away some time ago and there is a Curtis farm on the maps just south of them at the intersection of Sharon Hollow and Trolls Road. So Kate and Rory are north, of Sharon, north on Sharon Hollow above Trolls Road between that and Washburn so they're getting kind of high up there in Sharon Township. and. Um, I said, well, it's a theory, you know, it's, it's, the house was rebuilt in 1917. It could have been rebuilt just as a matter of rebuilding the house or it could have been the fact that it was damaged by the tornado. So let's research the tornado and see where it went and that's how this talk got going. So here's what we did. Uh, we began by looking for um, various news articles, what was available out there. Um, the Chelsea Standard newspapers are online on the Chelsea District Library website. Um, so we knew the date of the tornado was June 6, 1917 and um, we went and looked at those online. Now at the time I looked, which was probably a month ago, the website was working fine. I was able to pull up the newspaper clipping that talked about this 
And fortunately, I cut and pasted the text out of it onto my computer because since then I've not been able to access this website. Um, what's interesting about this is they refer to it as a cyclone, not a tornado. And I've, several people I've talked to in preparing for this thing said, well, we've always called it a cyclone. But we think of cyclones out in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. So I did a little bit of research to figure out what's the difference between a tornado, a cyclone, a hurricane, a typhoon, okay, all that stuff. And back in 1917, um, they did call these things cyclones. They used that term the same way we would call it a tornado. But tornadoes and cyclones and hurricanes and typhoons are very different things. They're both spinning wind, but they got very different causes to them. What struck here in Sharon Township and Freedom Township was a tornado, clearly. Uh, the term cyclone now is applied only to certain meteorological phenomena in the Pacific Ocean. Hurricanes are only applied to certain meteorological formations in the Atlantic Ocean. And typhoons are somewhere off there by Japan. So <laughs> it seems to have evolved over the last hundred years that what we call today a tornado, because hurricanes and typhoons and um, um, cyclones can't hit Michigan. They meteorologically can't occur here. So we do have some straight line wind events, but it's tornadoes that we have because of our particular topography and our lakes and so on. So the term cyclone and tornado was used interchangeably. When I looked at the Chelsea Standard from there, it talked about as a cyclone, okay? We also looked at the Manchester Enterprise, June 7, 1917, the Thursday, the tornado was on Wednesday, so fortunately the paper's all published on Thursday, and they reported right away on that. We do have a paper car copy of the article. And what we were fortunate in getting was um, a donated package here. Reno received this from a woman named Marilyn Lamb. I don't know if you may know Marilyn Lamb, but uh, she lived here for a while. She now lives in Fort Wayne, spends the winters in Florida. And she had a folder full of newspaper clippings from 1917. Um, all sorts of good data, some photographs, which you'll all see here tonight. So we benefited immensely from that. And in there was the Manchester Enterprise from June 7, 1917. And it's got a, the details in there. And both of these articles talk about it started here at Farm A, Farm B, Farm C, Farm D. It's naming all these people. And they're trying to follow the path of the tornado. Okay. Uh, we found an article from Manchester Enterprise from 1989, which is basically a reprint of the June 7, 2017 article, 1917 article. It added a photo. I'll show that in a minute. And then we have found an article from... Um, Bob Miller gave this to me. Somebody named M. S. Kleinen Smith here in Manchester. He's a current member. He's a member of the historical. He is. Yes. <laughs> What's his first name? Florida. Michael. 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 Michael Kleinen. I've never met him. Well, he lives in Florida now. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, in uh, June, June 6, in May of June of 2001, he wrote an article called "Looking Back," and he traced the tornado all the way from Kalamazoo over to Ann Arbor. And he's got a page here just dedicated from Sharon to Salem Township. And he's got a lot of the same information, but different, some different things in it. So we had these resources through news articles that we tried to pull together the most information we could find about who got hit by the tornado and what kind of a path did it take. Okay. We also consulted Reno Feldkamp, who's our resident expert here in Sharon Township. Uh, he's got a lot of stories. He'll add some details here later on on the tornado. Consulted with Bob Miller on Freedom Township. He collected information. As I mentioned, Rory and Kate uh, kind of got us started this project a little bit. The Maryland Lamb file and then uh, Bob Miller also brought in some photographs um, that were provided um, uh, as part of the Freedom Township History Project and brought those in. So that's what I'm going to be showing here tonight as we try to figure out a where did the tornado go and did it really affect their house or not okay so the storm began over in Calhoun County at a town called Climax it's been documented moved through Battle Creek came through Jackson County and entered Western Washtenaw County in Sharon Township so whoever was attracted this thing they, the total length going through Washtenaw County was 35 miles and it went through in less than an hour so it's kind of wandering around the uh, county I think is 30 miles wide and it's it kind of wandered around a bit. Struck Washtenaw County about 1 o'clock on Wednesday June 6, 1917. Now of course they didn't have equipment to really measure 
the speeds accurately, and they didn't have the Fujita scale back then, but people have studied the photographs, the amount of damage done to wood structures, the amount of damage done to brick structures, and basically deduced that it was an F4 tornado that came through based upon the photographic imagery, photographic imagery of the damage. A Sharon Township resident of that time which described it as a gigantic, swirling, grayish black ball growing larger and seeming to turn over and over as it neared the ground and began to strip off the tops of trees. Somebody else put together the information and said it caused over $500,000 in damage in 1917 dollars. Uh, 150 buildings on 50 farms were hit, rated F4, killed two and injured 27. Now, in all the records I've looked at for Sharon and Freedom, nobody was killed. There were records back then that said people were killed, but it turned out those records aren't correct. So whoever was killed, it was outside those two townships where that particular personal injury occurred. Here's the 1917 Manchester Enterprise article. I know it's difficult to read, kind of. Uh, I mean, they printed newspapers in 1917 with about a two font. I mean, it's just, I don't know how people did it back then without glasses. That's, and those old enterprises are terrible to read. So in this article, the reporter talks about heavy property loss, and he does this starting at the west side of Sharon Township and moving along through Sharon Township and then going over to Freedom Township. So he's going west to east following the tornado, and he names specific farms or farm or homesteads and specific people. Okay. Um, that's the second page of it. This was the 1989 version that was reprinted and it turns out it's the exact same article. So in 1989 the Enterprise reprinted that same article, much easier to read of course, and they added a photograph on there which I'll show in more detail later on. Okay, this is Klein and Smith article from 2001 and again it has additional data. I don't know where he got it from but he's got additional data on the people involved. And what we were specifically looking for was Curtis family because next to the McGoss family is the, they bought a Curtis farm and then um, down the road on Sharon Hollow by Trolls is another Curtis farm and as you'll see here when you look at the 1915 map there were Curtises all over the place. There were more Feld camps you can possibly count. All these different Feld camp farms trying to keep them all straight. Now who are they talking about when they just say the Curtis farm was damaged? Which one? Okay, so from these articles, the Detroit Free Press also reported on the tornado. So we found this article on the Free Press. Here they're more concerned about Ann Arbor and Chelsea. Okay, so they've, they're picking up after it's left Freedom and it's moving still northeast up into um, uh, Lima Township and uh, Lodi and up in that area there. So they talk about specific people, but there's nothing in here about Freedom or Sharon. We just didn't matter to the Detroit Free Press, I guess. So I went through all these articles and I listed every name that was brought up in there in Sharon Township and Freedom Township. If there was a first name I put it on there. Uh, and I, some notes about slight damage, total destruction, people injured and so on. So you see here names like Richard Curtis showing up. Now that's the farm that in 1915 was closest to McGough's house. It says major damage. Um, some people just had their windmills some had total destruction of the farm. Farmhouse, barns, everything came down. Um, it got very specific around Sharon Township. Sharon Township Hall, they call that Sharon Center. May still be called that Sharon Center. The original Sharon Township Hall was totally destroyed. I just learned doing this paper that the original Township Hall was on the south side of Pleasant Lake Road. And on the north side was a church and the cemetery. Okay, when they rebuilt the Township Hall, the church was blown away, they rebuilt the Township Hall on the north side of the road. So I, I marked down every one of the people involved with as much detail as I could in Sharon and in Freedom Township. So we have Ed Baker and Sharon Hollow over by the Sharon Mills now, slight damage. Richard Curtis, Ernest Smith, Ernest Raymond, what was then the George Curtis home, the former Samuel Smith family. These people are all on Pleasant Lake Road, right? As Pleasant Lake comes up out of Sharon Hollow, curves around and straightens out. All those, like the tornado was going right down the center of the road, pretty much following that. The Sharon Township Hall jumps over to um, the August Kebby Farm, which is the current Feldcap home. Uh, ends over on the, um, I should say, Chelsea Manchester Road, the Corwin Hill, where the gravel pit is now on M52. Did the same thing in Freedom. Went through and listed all the specific names 
uh, of people that were mentioned and my intent was to try to map these out and see if we could get them tied together. So we have that. So we, question? We're actually, we live in a Christian Grau home that was totally destroyed. Uh -huh. I have pictures of it here. You do? Great. The first house and then the, the, the one that's been rebuilt. Okay. That, yeah, I think I've got, pretty sure I had him on the list there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Christian Grau, total destruction. That's the one where the um, Amanda or Mabel, she was sometimes called Amanda Grau, was supposedly killed by the tornado, but she did survive. She was holding onto a tree in the yard and hurt her back from over here. Uh, she survived. Yeah. So again, I, we've got some cases of specific injuries, uh, minor injuries to Mrs. Marshall. Um, uh, some of the photographs I'll show you are people have cuts in their heads and stuff like that, but uh, we can't find any, any evidence anybody died in these two townships during the tornado. So we began with a 1915 plat map. That's the most, um, the closest to the tornado date of 1917 was the 1915 plat map. So we have the Sharon Township plat map and we had the Freedom Township plat map. And so our idea was to find on a plat map these names that we'd pulled out of the news articles. So this is a slice of uh, Sharon Township. And uh, just to kind of orient you, um, this is the Chelsea Manchester Road, M52, and this is Pleasant Lake Road coming across like this. So here is the Sharon Hollow area with the mill. Um, here is the Sharon Township, uh, Sharon Center with the uh, Township Hall and the cemetery. So we tried to plot, plot things out on this thing. And um, so for reference, here's McGough's home. It was the Fred Bristley home. I tried to research Fred Bristley and um, I found a lot of information. He, he eventually moved out of the area, went down to Blissfield or somewhere like that. I found his obituary. He was buried back in Oak Grove Cemetery. Um, I was just trying to find something that would say, you know, his house was destroyed and he left or something like that. I couldn't find that. But this again is Sharon Hollow Road and um, this is Trolls Road coming across right here. This is Sylvan. This is the Township Hall. So this is where the Goffs are now. And again, that little square, they were very precise on these plat maps about placing the house where it sat on the property. And that matches exactly 1856, 1864, 1874. So clearly a house was there. Just to kind of a double check, I did what was called a ghost image test. I think I've talked about this before with the Washtenaw County does aerial photography every three years of the county. They do it in the spring. They fly over the entire county. They take extremely highly detailed photographs because they're checking for building additions and, and things that are going on that people haven't applied permits for. And uh, uh, um, uh, I won't digress. I'll tell a story about that later on. <laughs> But these maps are extremely detailed and what they show, because they shoot them in March, the snow is gone, the foliage is all packed down, nothing is growing. And if there was a house somewhere on a piece of property or a barn with a foundation and it's gone now, you will see what I call a ghost image, a little rectangle or a square that says there's clearly was a house there because the soil got compacted, the stones are still there and you can see that. And we've helped a lot of people find their ancestors home from the 1850s by going on this website. You can put your mouse cursor on the spot. It will give you a GPS reading out to seven digits. You put that GPS reading in your iPhone and you walk out there in the field and beep, it takes you right to where the ghost image was. I looked for ghost images on Kate and Rory's property. I couldn't find any. I mean, the ghost images are very, very good. They, they will show up. Uh, clearly the land around there has never been disturbed in terms of a foundation. So your house is sitting on top of what was there before. Clearly was. And when I went out and looked at their house, it struck me that the foundation was an old foundation. That chimney was weird. And there was just other stuff there that said, this house got built on top of or around or whatever, what was there before. The question is, did the Fred Bristley in 1917, did he take the house down? Or was it damaged in some way that he just decided to rebuild it? Or did somebody else just do something completely different? So here they are up here. 
Now, when you look at the news articles that I mentioned earlier, the first article talks about Ed Baker. So this is Sharon Hollow. Here's where the river comes right through the mill pond. The mill is right there. Ed Baker's property had minor damage to it. Then the articles start going along, and they're mentioning all of these people along in here. I know this is kind of fuzzy to read, but uh, Henry Uphouse, totally destroyed. Um, Ernst Raymond's house, totally destroyed. So basically, you're following up Pleasant Lake Road. Samuel Smith, the property had been bought by an Ed Curtis just before the tornado. And the article talks about how he had made one land contract payment, and the whole thing was destroyed, and he had no insurance. None of these people had insurance back then. So pretty much everything in this area here suffered serious devastation. The one article I read talked about a Richard Curtis. So this is the closest house and property to the McGoffs. And um, I drove out, when I went to Kate's house, I drove in there and it looked to me like the barns and the house were newer, meaning early 1900s, not 1850s or 60s. So we're not totally sure. If, if something damaged here, would the tornado's effect reach out that far to where you out there on Sharon Hollow Road? We don't know for sure. And nobody mentioned Bristley in any of the articles. It could have been that it didn't get reported. He didn't report it. It wasn't serious enough. I don't know. So I'm not totally sure at this point. But anyways, all of these tornado effects centered around here. The Sharon Township Hall was totally destroyed. The church that was across the road was totally destroyed. The Civil War Memorial had about three feet of the thing cut off and blown away. The tombstones in the cemetery that's out there now, a lot of them got blown over and damaged. So there was pretty serious effects right in this area here. The next thing we see that jumps across over here to what was the Gus, or Augustus Kebby farm, which is again Feldkamp's current farm, on Smythe or Smith? Tell me again how that is. Is that Smythe Road or Smith Road? Smythe. Smythe. Smith. Smythe. It's supposed to be Smith. I've given up. It's supposed to be Smith, but it is Smythe. Right. And uh, okay. that's what we all call it now. So uh, at that time, the Kebby Farm was being apparently leased by a man named Middlemas. And uh, so there's a record of Middlemas, but the one article does say Middlemas is on Kebby's farm. So he was leasing it. So there was damage here. The barn was destroyed. Then we've got some evidence of Frank Marshall's up here. This is now on M52. And you're getting up towards where that gravel pit area is where the road climbs and swerves around. This place was totally destroyed. So the tornado basically is doing this kind of thing through Sylvan Township, uh, Sylvan, so through Sharon Township. So that's the first step we did, was trying to trace where the thing was going at. And then we did the same thing with Freedom Township. So we picked up here, totally destroyed the Geyer Farm, Wanks, uh, Lefflers, Lewis Geyer, Gottfried Grau, I guess that's how you growl, right there. Um, the Zion Church, the Parsonage, um, uh, all of these properties all had damage reports for them. So it looks like the tornado is still doing this kind of a thing and eventually heading off into uh, Lima Township. And uh, like I say, we did have a report from somebody who saw our Facebook post about this talk that her relative's farm was damaged on Steinbach Road in Lima Township. So that we only took it through the two townships. We were able to track down which places were actually damaged and reported in articles, able to trace that. So here's one photograph. Uh, this is the Ernest Raymond farm on Pleasant Lake Road between the Sharon Township Hall and Sharon Mills, um, the rear of the farm. I'm not sure what Waldo and Leroy Marks, Milton Vanderbilt and Arthur Shibley have to do with it, but that's the farm. That's the photograph from that time, so it's pretty well destroyed. I loved how these guys all had suits and ties on all the time. I know, right? <laughs> Sunday, Sunday. I don't know if they're out there on Sunday or they just got dressed up for the picture, but uh, <laughs> There, there. So that's the Ernst Raymond farm. We do a photograph of the damage on that one. Um, this is Sharon Township Hall. Sharon Town Hall. Um, so again, it was on the south side of uh, Pleasant Lake and um, uh, not, not much left of that. And unfortunately, I guess a lot of the records blew away. Um, 
what was it, about a month or two ago that Sharon Township had a 100th anniversary of their 1917 new Township Hall. Because right. I, saw, I, saw I saw the thing about it, I says, what, are they having a 100th anniversary? 100th anniversary of, um, I guess they had a little picnic out there and things going on, and um, it was the new Township Hall, the 100th anniversary of the new Township Hall on the north side of the road to replace this one. I, I'm not sure why they chose to rebuild it across the road, but they, they did. Um, this is the Marshalls Farm up on M52 Chelsea Manchester Road up by Corwin's Hill. Uh, pretty well devastated that place and um, you see there's a little girl sitting on top of a pile of debris there of some sort. Um, another photograph of the Marshalls Farm. Um, so the, the tornado, even though it had traveled about five or six miles through Sharon, uh, was still very strong, very devastating, and uh, um, you, Reno, know, said they never, re they moved, they never rebuilt this? That's right. Uh. They, uh, uh, they moved into town, and uh, the, the farm was where the uh, Marioki uh, house is now. There's yeah. a farm out from there, and a barn and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they took that over at I don't have a lot of information yeah. on that. So they apparently bought what was Jeremiah Corey's place somewhere in the 1910s or before that. Yeah, um, so we're trying to find as many oral histories or recollections as we can of some of these things. Uh, this again, here's the Marshall family in front of their place. Um, so you can see the young girl here had a had an injury of some sort. Uh, so people, maybe you're right, maybe they came out on Sunday and they just kind of gathered around and looked at what had happened there, but um, uh, certainly not much left there. Um, the, the two girls were blown out of the house and landed in a field. Yes, yeah. And, um, yeah, the articles talk about some of those stories about um, one young man being on top of a gravel wagon, being blown off. People. One young boy tried to go into a barn. Uh, the barn collapsed, but somehow he survived. And um, so, some of the stories that were reported in the articles that we have here um, turned out um, people were not killed. They were just injured and they recovered from them. But uh, um, this one just says F. D. Hay. And I tried to research who F.D. Hay might be, and I couldn't find anything on them. That's, that's the only thing written on the back of the photo. It's a little, the photo is blurry, but uh, I don't know if he was somebody that was leasing a space or whatever, but there's no record of him. I looked in census records, I looked at different things, I couldn't figure out who F.D. Hay was. Um, this is the Wank Farm, um, and it's certainly one of the sharpest photographs we have in terms of clarity. So the Wank Farm now, when it got into Freedom Township, it was following Waters Road pretty much ran down Waters Road um, from the west side of the township over towards Fletcher Road. And um, I mean, maybe Bob, you can help on this. There were, there were many different wanks that I found on that map. It's like you try to find feld camps, you know, it's just there's, they're all over the place. So if the article says it was a feld camp farm, which one was it? And the same thing with wanks. So I'm pretty sure this was a wank farm on Waters Road. There was one there. Um, with that name, but very sharp picture. I mean, just uh, uh, I get the sense they all came out in the same day, and there's a photographer out there doing the work. Um, so this again is in Freedom Township, best we can tell. Um, this picture just says Edna Brightonwisher. <coughs> Any idea who Edna Brightonwisher might be? Edna Marshall. Oh, She's one of the Marshall. sisters that. Was blown into the field. Okay. And she she got this cut and she had left a permanent scar uh, for the rest of her life. Okay. The, 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 now I've got a picture of them. I think the next one, but this one, I, I'm not sure whose. Is it the Marshall Farm? I, I think so. Could be. I there was nothing else written on the picture besides that. Um, so. So Edna Marshall, that Edna M, that's what that is. The picture says Edna M, she's got the bandage on her forehead there. The other one says Lanara. 
That's, that's the name, L-E-N-A-R-A. -A. So this, the woman on the right is Lanara. Where am I? E-R-M-A, that's your sister. Uh, well, it's, the, actually on the back of the picture, it does say L-E-N-A-R-A. -A. Oh, no. Yeah, so. This was in June? June, yes. June, Wednesday. 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 Uh, I know. No, it was June 6, 1917. Hmm. That's when it occurred. <laughs> this picture is not very good. It, uh, it it just says the Wank Farm again. Um, here they call it a tornado. Uh, that one didn't that one didn't come out too good, but the. This is the Zion Church at, um, at Waters and Fletcher in the northwest corner. The roof got blown off on it. The roof and the steeple are totally gone. A lot of damage around the church itself. Um, so a tornado basically looks like it's going straight down Waters Road, approaching intersection when you look at the map. Um, this is a book that Bob had. You want to talk about what this is? This 50 year anniversary book? Yeah, it's 50th anniversary. Yeah. And uh, so the church was founded in 1867, good year. And um, in 1917, they had a 50-year anniversary celebration, which occurred shortly after, about three months after the tornado. So the celebration appears to be September 15th, 1917. And this first picture shows the um, rebuilt church, the roof and the steeple. And um, Bob's got a copy of the program. Of course, the program's all in German. And it's German script, which to me is totally indecipherable. Uh, but it does show the picture of the church after they, they, they got together pretty quickly between June 6th and September 15th. They rebuilt the roof and the steeple on the church, got that done. And the next picture shows what it looked like before. And that's the before picture, so the steeple is different. Uh, I'll just back it up again so if you want to see that. Yeah, they rebuilt it. That's the old one, the old view of the church itself. Um, now, we've got a group of pictures here that don't have any identification on them. Um, um, I just called them Freedom 1 through Freedom 6 because I thought they were Freedom Township. I mean, Bob felt they may be Freedom Township. Uh, they were pictures that were brought in many years ago when Freedom Township um, had a history night and invited people to bring in old pictures. And uh, uh, those old pictures were brought in, they were scanned. I think it was Cheryl Purell that did that, that night. And she scanned a bunch of pictures, but the people who brought the pictures in didn't know exactly what they were. So this one is apparently somewhere in Freedom Township. And um, way in the background, there's a church steeple back here. It doesn't show up too well on the screen, but there's a church steeple. So we're trying to, you know, figure out what am I looking at there? Where am I? Um, of course, I think no. It might be St. John. I think so. We're looking uh, south, mm. I'm guessing. Okay. And Rogers Corners is sort of the, the horizon there at the end of the road. Right over here somewhere in that area. So, again, that's, uh, we, we don't have clear identification on that. There was obviously some damage on the house there. Um, the uh, telegraph or telephone wires fell on the car. Uh, the, the tire is blown. I don't know what happened to the tire there, but there's no tire in the back. So it could have been picked up by the tornado, spun around a bit. Um, but there's some sort of electrical wires laying across the front of this thing uh, in this picture. Um, again, another picture we're not sure what it's showing. Um, some of the images we have are of brick homes that were damaged pretty badly, and that's why I think where these experts got the idea it was an F4 tornado, was that the brick places were damaged quite severely also um, in these pictures. Um, again, not too sure. What, what I'm looking at in this picture, this is what I brought up earlier, Bob, was this, this thing right here looks like a metal rail. And I'm wondering if this picture was taken along the trolley, the trolley line, so it's actually on Jackson Road. It's in Lima, not in Freedom. But uh, it looked to me like, plus you got those poles that look like they're carrying a telegraph line or something involved with the railroad. 
it just if you look at the picture, it just looks like there's a straight rail thing running across that one there, but uh, it could be up in Lima somewhere along Jackson Road. We heard that the last damage was at the corner of uh, Jackson and Wagon Road. That could be, yeah. Up in and the mail from Freedom Township was found is that way is Livonia. Livonia? Yeah, I think like Garden City, Livonia. Really? Showed up like months later and somebody said, <laughs> hey, by the way. By the way, we found this mail. Um, we haven't been able to identify where this house is specifically, but uh, basically just lifted it off the foundation and set it down bounding. So, life in a crooked house. And then we've got one more. Um, if you look at the 50th anniversary celebration book of Zion Lutheran Church, they have a picture of the parsonage in there that looks just like that. And I'm speculating that that might be the parsonage of Zion Lutheran Church. That's not certain of it, but the window fenestration and the shapes of the roof and everything are. Yeah, that house is still there. So that is it, huh? Yep. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. Ray, the problem is the uh, history of the church tells that the meeting, a meeting was held on two days later in the parsonage by the board to determine what to do with the church. So I don't think they well, could have met in that. Well, it could, could still be in one piece enough to do that, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so um, our goal was really to try to figure out exactly where this tornado struck, what records we had of it. Um, uh, like I say, not, we don't have photographs of everything, but clearly from the reporting that was done, we could trace the path of the tornado through the two townships we were looking at. And we've had reports from Lima, and uh, um, obviously you've, got, you've seen other reports of, of different locations. Um, uh, tornado did go on at least up towards Ann Arbor. Um, the, we'll put all of this into our archives. Um, if people have other photographs, or news articles or any kind of recollections. We'd like to get that and scan that and put it into our collections also. But uh, I just thought it was uh, interesting. It's not so much a celebration, but a remembrance of 100 years ago. It happened 100 years ago, and I thought it'd be good to try to do that tonight. And I'm afraid, Rory and Kate, I don't have a definitive answer on your house. <laughs> I, I still want to try to look up Fred Bristley a little bit more. Um, it seemed too much of a coincidence he would rebuild the house in 1917. Um, and if indeed the Richard Curtis farm at Trolls and Sharon Hollow was damaged, that's getting fairly close. Fairly close. And uh, so your question started a mystery here. <laughs> I don't have a hard solution to it, but it's just kind of fun looking at this stuff to see what was going on. Um, uh, it, Anyone else have comments? You have anything else you want to add to your? You live in the Christian Growl House now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I just brought up a picture of it. Okay. Yeah, a picture of our house in the field after it hit. <coughs> Some of the ones you don't have. That's, oh yes, yes. That was a direct hit. The church. There's a church. Rogers yeah, there's right right there. Okay, I see it. So that's looking east. Yeah, we'd love to get this. You can, and then I mean, I mean we can go through these later but yeah put them up here and have people come and look at them there's a whole bunch here yeah thank you for bringing that appreciate mm -hmm. it any other comments or questions yes actually i believe that fred bristley was our great grandpa and i don't know if the house was damaged during the second i know our farm where my parents lived they had some damage just to the fields and everything Okay. Where where was that at? Uh, Pleasant Lake and Smith Road. Okay. Yep. But well, yeah. My mom might know, but oh, yeah. that's what we're looking for: is the, the stories passed down. I know Kate's been trying to contact Curtis relatives yeah. to see if if you know stories came down like the house was damaged or destroyed or something like that. Yeah, we haven't had much luck yet so far, but yeah, yeah. working on that. Yeah, trying to pull together um, any kind of um, oral commentary or written commentary. So I did try finding Fred Bristley. I mean, I, I found when he bought the place and uh, uh, from what I gather, he was a single man. No. He wasn't. Okay, I, I can't find any evidence. That they, they actually lived on Grass Road in Saline and moved up 
to the Curtis house there. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure really when that was. And did he then move down to, I can't remember what it was, Milan, Dundee, Blissfields? I don't know. Because I was trying to trace him, and um, I know he's buried in Oak Grove. I found his obituary. I was just trying to find any kind of information about him. But nothing ever said anything about his wife or kids or anything. So I may have the wrong person, but if you... Pretty sure. If you... It wasn't, if it wasn't grandparent, it was an uncle. Okay. A great uncle. Okay, thank you. Appreciate knowing that. Um, anything else? Other comments? I got one slide left. It's a different topic altogether, but... Okay. Dan, you want to say something? Well, yes, if, yeah, please, if you have more. Come on up. You want to talk some more about it? I'll yes. Start yes, please do. Well, I mean, how uh, uh, Ray and I have had several conversations about this topic. And so he asked me to put together. Right, okay. Uh, he asked me to put together what I remember, and uh, I remember my father, uh, Antenfeld Camp, who at that time was 24 years old and living on the farm that uh, many of us came to know, to know as the uh, Dwayne Hesworth place, and he, um, he saw that tornado, and he was uh, uh, shortly down to the Marshall farmstead and remembers Edna and Irma um, coming out of the wreckage of that home. Uh, Irma was the one that had a permanent damage uh, to her forehead, carried a scar the rest of her life. I knew that woman only slightly and I don't remember the scar. Maybe uh, she wore her hair in such a manner that kept it covered. But uh, 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 there was a report that Edna was the one that was uh, injured. It was, uh, they were both banged up, but Irma is the one that had the permanent scar. I, uh, I'm having trouble reading my own writing here. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm quite sure it was my dad that, that, uh, uh, that told me about that. And yet it seems like somebody else was involved, but uh, uh, I'm going to credit my dad with uh, giving me that information.